Well, good morning and welcome. So good to see you here today. We appreciate all of you for coming and sharing with us. And I appreciate those wonderful songs this morning. Uh, I want to just say a, a hallelujah, praise the Lord, hallelujah, for answer prayer. Uh, we have been praying for a number of issues in this church. Uh, two of them are here today, Nelson Yagen. Nelson went through uh, cancer surgery last week. And he's here worshiping today, and Lauren is here. We've been praying for her, and we appreciate her coming and worshiping today. Uh, baby Seska will probably get to go home, I think, Tuesday. Uh, Brandy Browning, we were praying for the baby, and those prayers have been answered. My son-in-law uh, went through uh, uh, esophageal cancer surgery, and uh, just the doctors were just saying how incredible all of that has been. So, hallelujah. All this we sing is true in the Lord. How mighty is our God. How wonderful that is. You know, he hears our cries. He hears the pleas of our heart. And he answers our prayers. And he meets our needs. And so we have every reason to rejoice in the Lord today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Children, we want to dismiss you for Children's Church at this time. If you will go ahead and ease on out. Again, thank you for coming and being with us today. We're going to continue this morning in our sermon series from Galatians. Church, the story is told of a man who was looking for a job, and he noticed that there was a help wanted sign at the local zoo. He decided to inquire about the job and discovered that the the zoo had a very unusual position that they needed to fill. You see, apparently the, the gorilla at the zoo had passed away, and until they could get a new gorilla brought in, they needed somebody to dress up in a gorilla suit and just pretend to be the gorilla. They told the man that the gorilla suit was very realistic, and all he would have to do is just walk around in the cage and eat and sit and sleep and kind of act like a gorilla. The pay wasn't bad, and so the guy really needed a job, and so he said, okay. Well, he put on the gorilla suit, took his position at the back of the cage early that morning, and he just pretended to sleep most of the day. And, but then he got kind of tired of just sitting there, and so he, he started walking around a little bit and jumping up and down and started making a few gorilla noises, and the people that were watching really liked that. They kind of got into it. When he would jump around and climb a tree, then the people started clapping and cheering. It wasn't long until he was attracting quite a crowd. His ego got the best of him, and he started playing to the crowd. And the more he acted like a gorilla and jumped around and climbed, why, the more the people uh, clapped and applauded. And then all of a sudden... He decided he was going to really put on a show. and So he climbed a tree and he was swinging on the vines back and forth. And he reached the highest point when suddenly the vine broke. And he fell across the wall into the lion's cage next door. The man in the gorilla suit was frantic because he stood up and started looking around. And all of a sudden he saw this large, huge lion looking at him. And he realized he was in trouble. And so he started screaming, Hey, hey, I'm just a man in a gorilla suit. Get me out of here. I'm not really a gorilla. I'm just acting like a gorilla. Help me. And the lion quickly pounced on the man, held him down and said, Shut up, shut up. You're going to get us both fired. <laughs> Church, I wanted to share that humorous little story with you this morning to get you to think about the fact that sooner or later our real identity becomes obvious. Do you realize that? You see, sooner or later we all get found out and our cover gets blown. So the question for each of us is, who are we? And who are we trying to be? You know, we've learned from this sermon series that those of us who are in Jesus Christ, we're children of God. 
We've been saved by God's grace and we've been filled with His Spirit and He wants us to learn to walk in that Spirit. And so another question to consider is, are we really people who are sowing to the Spirit or are we actually people who just give lip service to the Spirit? And in truth, we're really sowing to the flesh. You know, those are critical questions that we really need to pause and think about. Today, as we continue our study in the book of Galatians, we, we come to chapter 6, and we're going to look at the, the first 10 verses of chapter 6 today. In these verses, Paul gives us what appears to be three random thoughts. First, he talks about bearing burdens, and then he talks about sharing with one's teacher, and then he talks about sowing and reaping. And at first glance, church, these seem unrelated to one another. But church, I believe that after you examine them closely, you see that they are related to one another. And they were challenges to the Christians who were in the churches of Galatia at that time. What we see Paul doing in this present section is giving some, some concrete illustrations of, of what it means to live as a Christian, a Christian who's guided by freedom and by walking in the Spirit. In other words, how are we or should we be Spirit-filled, Spirit-guided Christians? Well, let's see what Paul stated in that. Paul says spiritual people bear one another's burdens. Look at Galatians 6, beginning at verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Now notice here, church, Paul explains two ways that we carry the burdens of those that are around us. First of all, we do it by restoring the fallen and then by helping the hurting. And as we explore these activities of spiritual people, we need to keep in mind, church, that these are not ministries that are reserved just for the preacher, just for the elders, just for the, the leaders of the church, but rather they're ministries for all spiritual people, people who are willing to get involved in someone else's life, in someone else's troubles, in someone else's trials. Well, okay, so who are these fallen people and how are we supposed to help them? Well, in verse 1, Paul gives us four answers to that question. First, the fallen ones are people who are trapped in sin. And the word that he used here describes, it's like a bird who gets trapped in a, in a cage. It describes a believer who's suddenly overcome by temptation. It's a picture of a believer whose leg is caught in a snare and, and it's broken. And suddenly that broken bone and that broken person has no hope for escape. So what's needed by a person that's in a condition like that? Well, they need somebody to see and somebody to hear their cry. That's what they need. And secondly, Paul says that they require the help of spiritual people. Touch this phrase here, you who live by the Spirit, describes those who are walking in the Spirit. 
those who are filled with the Spirit, those who are producing the fruit of the Spirit that we talked about last week, those who are keeping in step with the Spirit, with the leader. So please understand, this isn't meant to describe just a, a certain class of, of super spiritual Christians. It's really any Christian, anybody who loves the Lord and loves their fellow man as themselves. One writer comments that truly spiritual Christians would actually never use a term like this to describe themselves. But the mark of their spirituality is that they, they're alarmed by what sin does in a person's life, and, and they're concerned, and so they, they want to come and walk beside that person. They want to help that person. And thirdly, Paul says that they must be restored gently. The word restored was used for setting a broken bone in a person's body. You know, if you've ever had a broken bone, I had one in high school, my collarbone, playing football. It's a very painful experience, but it's even more painful when the doctor's not gentle with you and he's trying to set that bone. Even though he's wanting to help, it can be hurtful as you go through that process. That's why the work of spiritual restoration is to be done gently. And then finally, Paul says they must be approached carefully. Now, this is a warning, church, that we all need to consider. Paul says we must be careful in our helping lest we should be tempted also. See, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know Satan can be pretty tricky, amen? He really can be. And he knows if he can get one Christian trapped, then it becomes easier sometimes to get another one trapped along beside them. And the way Satan works is, is kind of like flypaper. You catch one fly and another fly comes along to help out and and pretty soon that fly is trapped as well. The sin we may get caught in while trying to help another may be that sin that they're in. But more often than not, it's another sin when we try to help somebody. And that's the sin of pride. Now think about that for just a moment. The second ministry of bearing another's burden is a bit broader than this first one. It certainly includes restoring the fallen, but it goes on to include ministering to those who are hurting for any reason. The carrying of the burden of verse 2 refers to the overwhelming load and impossibly huge boulder weighing on a person down as, as they travel along this highway of life that we all experience. And the burden may be things like sickness, calamity, financial difficulties, broken dreams, a failed marriage, family problems, career setbacks, the death of a loved one. You know, when we look around our congregation, those are things that impact all of us, amen? And they can happen to anybody, no matter how spiritual you are. And church, I find it significant that in both cases, the case of the, the fallen into sin and those who are burdened, Paul doesn't focus on the specifics of the sin. What matters to Paul is that we do something to help our brothers or sisters regardless of the circumstances. And by helping someone carry their burden, we're actually fulfilling the law of Christ. And the law of Christ is to love your neighbor as yourself. And what better demonstration of our love is there than to coming along beside somebody and helping them in their times of struggle and trials. 
You know, in the last few verses of this section, Paul mentions a, a danger that we should all avoid, and that is that pride. You know, when we see our brothers or sisters stuck in a trial or temptation, we can become prideful if we're not careful. You see, it's really easy to look down our nose at somebody who's going through a difficulty and say, you know, they deserve that. They shouldn't be behaving like that. They're getting what they deserve. I would never do something like that. Maybe they'll listen to me next time. Those kind of thoughts ever gone through your mind? That's pride. It's very easy for us to condemn others, to look the other way as we pass them on the road and to go around and walk on the other side because we don't want to get involved. When our hearts are filled with pride, we think we're something special. Then we find it very easy to be judgmental, to be condemning. But when we have humility, when we realize, church, that we are nobody special apart from the grace of God himself, then we're quick to forgive, quick to have compassion, quick to offer that helping hand that a person needs. To put it another way, the more conscious we are of our own sinfulness, the more forgiving and patient we are in the failures of other people. Perhaps if we take a look in the mirror, we just might realize that we're not as great as we think we are and that our neighbor is not as bad as we think they are. You know, as Paul wrote these verses in this section, I believe he had the Judaizers in mind as he tried to contrast how the, the legalist and the spirit-led person would be different. The legalist is, is really not interested in bearing people's burdens Rather, the legalist so many times adds to a person's burdens. Instead of trying to restore an erring brother, the legalist will condemn him and then use that brother and his trials to make themselves look good. The Bible talks about that in Luke chapter 18. I encourage you to read that sometime. The legalist lives by competition. By comparison, and he tries to, to make himself look good, look holy, look righteous in the eyes of other people. And the way Paul ended this section in verse 5 makes it sound like it contradicts verse true, but there, there's not a contradiction because Paul used two different Greek words and was speaking of two different kinds of burdens. In verse 2, he used the word meaning a heavy burden. But in verse 5, he uses a word that, that means like a, a soldier's backpack. You see, we should help each other bear the heavy burdens of life. But there are personal responsibilities that each person must bear for themselves. And that primary personal responsibility is our relationship with God. And see, nobody else can bear that responsibility but us. So notice here, church, the first lesson for today is that spiritual people, spiritual people are to come along beside and carry the burdens of others. Secondly, spiritual people support their teachers. Spiritual people support their teachers. Look at what verse 6 shares with us. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Church, in many of Paul's letters, he stressed the principle that those who minister the word of God 
deserve to be financially supported in doing that. There's some passages that I encourage you to jot down and read that substantiate that, okay? F.F. F. Bruce, the great commentator, wrote, The teacher relieves the ignorance of the pupil. The pupil should relieve the teacher of concern for his substance. And I think that's a true statement. William Barclay wrote, If a man is teaching you eternal truths, the least you can do is share with him such material things as you possess. As you will recall, church, being supported financially was was a privilege that Paul worked hard at not taking advantage of. But evidently there was some problem that was going on in the churches in Galatia, and perhaps they had made a good start in their financial support, but had become weary and decided to back away. Maybe they were arguing that they were now free in Christ and they could use their money in other ways and other opportunities. We don't know what they were saying, but we do know that of all the things that Paul might have mentioned that spiritual people should be doing, he chose to mention relieving the financial burden of those who teach the Word of God. I want you to know that Paul's closest parallel passage is a passage found in Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9, 11, where he says, If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? Church, I want to take a moment right here to compliment this body of believers at North Park Christian Church. I want you to know that I very much appreciate the way this church has financially supported me over the 14 years that I've been here. You have been a very generous people, and that's what spiritual people are supposed to be, generous. Spiritual people are to be good stewards of their money, but they're also to cheerfully invest their tithes and love offerings in spiritual things. You see, that's God's desire. That's what God wants you to do. That's why it's important that you support financially me or the new minister that will someday stand in this pulpit. Help he and his family just like you've helped me because God wants you to do that. Thirdly, Paul says spiritual people sow what is good. Our section for today in Galatians 6 ends with verse 7. says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Now, two important principles concerning spiritual sowing are found in these verses. First of all, we do reap what we sow. We do reap what we sow. Now, church, that's both a promise and a warning. This is God's principle and rule. And you cannot pull the wool over God's eyes when it comes to this principle. For example, if you plant wheat out in the field, you're going to reap wheat. You're not going to get corn. It's going to produce wheat. If you plant pumpkin seeds, you're going to get pumpkins, not oranges. Same color, but not the same thing. Now, 
With that thought in mind, I want you to picture a farm with two fields. One is labeled the flesh, and the other is labeled the spirit. Every day, church, we have hundreds of chances, opportunities to sow in one of these two fields. Everything we do is going to be sown to either the flesh or to the spirit. Every word we speak, every step we take, every decision we make leads us to sowing in one of these two fields. That includes, brothers and sisters, what? What we read, how we dress, who we talk to, what we watch on television, what music we listen to, what video games we play, where we decide to surf the internet. You see, every day, our life is a series of choices. And every choice we make will sow to one of these two fields. What we should expect if we sow to the flesh, Paul says you're going to reap corruption. And that shouldn't surprise us. If we sow to the Spirit, Paul says we'll reap eternal life. And that shouldn't surprise us. We reap what we sow. And once the sowing is finished, then the harvest can't be changed. Secondly, we learn that reaping a godly harvest requires patience and persistence. Does anybody know that farming is hard work? Have you ever, have you ever done any farming? Amen. You know, I can remember as a little boy growing up on the farm in East Tennessee. It's hard work. That old sun gets hot out there when you got a hoe and you're chopping weeds. Been there, done that. It's hard work. Breaks your back, you know. It's a year-round task. You can't get any time off. There's no end to the jobs that a farmer has to do. If you want to harvest, then you've got to work. Even when you feel like giving up. The seed that's planted doesn't bear fruit immediately. If you keep going over and digging up the seed to see what it's doing, it's not going to grow. Effective farming requires patience and persistence. I love what Calvin Coolidge, the 30th president of the United States, one day, he says, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with great talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistent determination alone is omnipotent. Let me share a story with you about one of the greatest NFL running backs of all time. It was a guy named Walter Payton. Even though Walter Payton was only 5 feet 10 inches tall, he only weighed 202 pounds, he held the, career, uh, the rushing yard career record for the NFL for many years until Emmett Smith finally broke his record. And church, I learned this week that during Walter Payton's 13-year career, he carried the football over nine miles. Nine miles. Now, you might think in your mind, well, nine miles ain't nothing. Hey, I know guys who uh, run marathons. There's one guy who's run four marathons. That's 104 miles. Nine miles? But church, if you divide those nine miles by the number of times Walter Payton ran the ball, you discover... He got knocked down ever 4.4 yards. Every time he ran the ball, that was his average, 4.4 yards. 
Do you think anybody running a marathon would continue running it if they got knocked down over 4.4 yards? Walter Payton carried the ball 3,838 times. And the vast majority of those times, he got tripped, knocked down, tackled, and not in a gentle way. Okay? Can you imagine the persistence of Walter Payton to keep doing that? Play after play, game after game, for 13 years? Now imagine your life being like a football game. Imagine the struggles and the, the challenges and the heartaches if you were tackled every 4.4 yards that you were going through your trials, be awful easy to quit. Be awful easy to grow weary and give up. Say, who needs this? We need to remember life's hard. It is. But God can deal with that hardness. We need to remember that people are difficult, but God can help you love those people anyway. We need to remember that things don't always go as we plan, but God can help us go forward anyway. We need to remember that not all your prayers are going to be answered the way you want them answered, but we should keep on praying anyway. We need to remember that God doesn't always do what we think He should do, but we're to trust him anyway. We need to remember that many times we're so scared about tomorrow, but we're to keep on believing anyway. And all the while we're going through our pity parties and our moments of doubt, God is in heaven cheering us saying, don't give up, don't stop, don't grow weary, keep sowing in the Spirit, because there's a wonderful harvest that's coming to you. And you're going to reap it. And you're going to rejoice. And you're going to be thankful. You're going to see things that you can't begin to comprehend. He says in Corinthians, No eye has seen, no ear heard, no mind conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. Man, that's a harvest, church. God's preparing that. So don't quit. Don't give up. Paul says, as we, have, as we have opportunity, we must do good to all, especially to those in the household of God. Oh, church, I love you, warts and all. And I hope you love me, warts and all. Because that's what God wants us to do. We must seize the opportunity before it disappears. You see, it's so easy to miss what God has placed before us. That's why we have to walk in the Spirit and, and keep in step with the Spirit because it is the Spirit that enables us to see what God is preparing tomorrow and next week and down the road. So don't quit. Because when you walk in the Spirit, He'll reveal to you the things that are coming up, the blessings He has in store. That's why prayer is so important. This church is a praying church. We've got so many testimonies we can share how those prayers have been answered, and they will be answered. So keep praying. Keep being a part of the One Church, One Day initiative. That's having an impact in this city like you can't comprehend. God is going to move in Houston, Texas in a way that boggles our minds. But it's the Spirit of God that's doing the preparation as you are faithful to go to your knees in prayer. As God's people, we want to be spiritual people. People who are filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit. 
And we want that to be our spiritual identity. In today's section from Galatians 6, we've learned three things about spiritual people. Spiritual people bear one another's burdens. Spiritual people support their teachers. And spiritual people sow what is good. That's who you are. That's what you're to do. Church, how many of us realize that this world is passing away and that life's short? Have you come to that realization yet? Boy, I have. I tell you what, I look back and I go, wait a minute, what happened to the 40s and 50s? Man, they're gone, you know? I remember when my kids were small, but how'd they get so old so fast? Wow, went by so quick. But how sad so many people in the world are are sowing to the flesh and will come to the end of their lives with nothing of eternal value to show for their effort. Beloved, you and I are called to show them a better way by seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and then by sowing to the Spirit. Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth. That's a fact. He promised us. He's coming back. Are you ready for that? Are you sowing to the Spirit for that day, that moment, that time when that trumpet's going to blare and time on this earth will be no more? Are you, are you ready for that? Are you sowing for that? Whatever we sow, that's what we're going to reap. So what is your real spiritual identity? Be truthful. Remember, God knows he can't be fooled. And most of all, church, he won't be mocked. What is your spiritual identity? Bow with me as we close in prayer this morning. Father, I thank you so much once again for how Paul has guided us and helped us to see what it really means to be people who walk close to you, to be spirit-filled, spirit-guided people. Thank you for making this church that kind of church. We're still a work in process. We haven't gotten it right yet, but we're working at it. And, Lord, we're going to have a greater impact the more we work at it, the more we stand strong and do those things that you've asked us to do. So, Lord, help us to sow to that spirit feel this afternoon, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, whatever time we have left. Let's think about which field are we sowing in? What are we doing? What are our words and actions proving what's important in our lives? As William and the praise team come now and lead us in a song of invitation, Lord, I just pray that you'll move in our hearts. Maybe there's somebody here today that's never named Christ as their Lord and Savior. They need to do that before he comes back. I pray they'll do it today. Maybe there are those here that have prayer needs Nothing would give us greater honor than to lift them up in prayer, to encourage them and to hold their hand as they walk through the burdens of this life. Lord, may your spirit just take control right now. May your kingdom come today, this moment, this time, in our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name I pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand.